This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this special edition of Nightly Business Report. I'm Tyler Matheson. And I'm Sue Herrera. The first few weeks of 2015 started where 2014 left off with a focus on energy. Both West Texas Intermediate and Brent Crude have continued their dramatic declines, and forecasts are calling for prices to fall even further. And the reason is simple. The world is producing more oil than it is using. And tonight we're going to examine why declining oil prices matter so much investors, to consumers, to the economy, to states, from Texas to North Dakota, and even to the housing market. We begin with the economy. At this time last year, oil was trading well above $100 a barrel. This month, a barrel of West Texas Intermediate dipped below 50. So how will this dramatic collapse in energy costs impact the U.S. economy and consumers? Steve Leisman takes a look. Plunging oil prices have raised a few economic puzzles. First, since the U.S. is now such a huge oil producer, will they be a drag on the economy or a benefit? Second, and this is key to the first, what will consumers do with the windfall? Save it, spend it, or pay down debt? Disappointing retail sales in December suggest consumers parting only reluctantly with those extra petrodollars in their pockets. The consumer is cautious and sort of waiting to see if this, uh, this gas price thing is real. And I think they take a while before they adjust their spending pattern. To be sure, the case is not closed. Consumer spending was strong in October and November, leading some economists to forecast that fourth quarter growth will sport the best consumer spending number since the Great Recession ended. The December data may yet be revised, and just because consumers took a break doesn't mean that the oil windfall won't find its way into mall cash registers in January and beyond. I think it's a blip in an otherwise strong trend for the consumer because look at the consumer backdrop. Healthy job growth, increase in disposable income, savings from the drop in gasoline prices, lower interest rates, wealth appreciation, um, and consumer sentiment is improving. Now let's go back to the first question. Is the plunge in oil good or bad for the U.S. economy? Right now, stock markets see only the negative, plunging oil profits and oil stock prices. Soon enough, capital spending could take a hit as producers scale back on drilling new wells. And then there's the uncertainty. Are oil prices down because demand and growth are weak worldwide? Now it's clear why the consumer is so key. Spending should be the offset to the petro-pessimism, but so far, it's not. The rule of thumb is that every $10 a barrel decline in oil means an extra quarter point to growth. But right now, the rule is being challenged, as are the optimists, who see lower oil prices as a positive for the U.S. economy, but are still waiting for proof. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman. And as Steve explained, for now, cheap crude does mean more cash for consumers and economic growth. Uh, but some are still wondering how low is too low for oil. It is a delicate balance, and there could be a point where the drag on the economy outweighs the pickup in consumer spending. Jackie DeAngelis explains. The crude crush continues with no end in sight. Prices on both sides of the Atlantic now under $50 a barrel. While cheap crude means consumers could save 50 to 75 billion on gas this year, according to AAA, many are wondering how low is too low for oil. The tipping point where the drag on the economy outweighs the pickup in consumer spending. We're in the beginnings part of the price zone right now that hurts production in a big way and starts to reverberate through the economy, the manufacturing economy especially. It'll be particularly painful if we do break the $40 level. And then if we do break the $33 level, which is my low price target, and we go down into the 20s, uh, then it's going to be a, a real uh, bleak situation. Production is just one risk if oil falls too low. The ripple effect is big oil laying off workers and pulling back on hiring. In theory, upwards of one and a half million jobs could be at stake if crude collapses to $20 or lower. There's also a global impact. Low oil prices don't just hurt the U.S., they could hurt Canada, Russia, Venezuela, and Brazil, to name a few. Analysts worry that the fallout from this could trigger some sort of global financial crisis. So how low will oil prices go and how long will we stay there? Goldman Sachs adjusting its 2015 price forecast to $47 a barrel and saying we could stay under $45 before the fourth quarter of this year. 
I do agree with Goldman Sachs's forecast. When you look at the supply demand dynamic, it's still heavily skewed towards the supply side, and it doesn't look like it's going to change before the beginning of the summer. So I would expect prices to be low uh, going into the summer. While supply is key, so is demand, and neither are seen changing anytime soon. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jackie DeAngelis. And John Kilduff joins us now to talk more about energy and his outlook for oil prices. We heard in Jackie's piece, John, uh, that you were looking at about $33 a barrel. We, last time we saw that was the financial crisis. What's going to drive it to 33 or close to it? And that's precisely where I get the number from, uh, that oil prices rallied from that number uh, to around $100 or plus for the past several years. Just on a basic sort of look at the chart as it's falling down, that should be the low point uh, for it. And it's just all this intense selling that's going on, uh, not just in crude oil, but in the commodity sector generally, everything mm -hmm. from, from live cattle to copper uh, to coal and iron ore. Uh, but that should be the landing point for crude. That's what, that's what gets some of the technical buyers back in this market to try to make a bottom finally stick here. You know, uh, you just mentioned $33 was where it settled during the financial crisis. At that time, uh, that oil price was a consequence of something else, of the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. Some people are saying, and Jackie just did in the piece, that this time if we go to 33 or be break below that, it could precipitate a financial crisis. Do you agree with that? And what is the transmission mechanism? How could that happen? Well, just like in the financial crisis when the, all the mortgages went bad and seemingly everybody participated from, from individual homeowners to the big banks to the big insurance companies because they all took a bet or made a bet uh, on, on housing. mortgages, housing and playing out correctly. I don't see this as that systemic, but mm -hmm. the fear is that you're going to have a lot of junk debt uh, implode and have a lot of these marginal companies go bankrupt. Once again, the bank's holding the bag. I don't think there's as much... Little drillers, little exploration companies that borrowed heavily. That are over leveraged. That are over leveraged. Yeah. Exactly right. And medium sized, but it's still only about 20% of the junk bond market. But that's the big fear. And I don't think there's... It's enough. It, it's, it's close. But I don't think there's the knock-on or the derivatives that were a part of the mortgage situation that are here. So you don't have people taking side bets on the bets that are in that market. Loans so aren't bundled. It's, exactly. And it's not, it's not as systemic. It's not as big. I don't think it's big enough to take us all down, but it will leave a mark. What about the destabilizing effect globally? Uh, you look at Russia, <laughs> which is suffering economically. Uh, Mr. Putin seems well ensconced there right now, but if we do see $33 a barrel oil, that could have a very destabilizing force. I think that's, the, for me, the scariest part of, of this whole story. Destabilizing in particular for Russia and Venezuela. Venezuela is just about broke now as it is. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure Putin survives actually in power throughout the, to the end of this year even uh, if the uh, Russian economy implodes over this, which is very likely to do. They're, they're hawking uh, the crown jewels, it, closing their uh, sovereign wealth fund to, to prop up the ruble. You even see the owner of the New York Nets uh, selling to, uh, to, help, to help the cause and repatriate. Mm -hmm. So they're in deep, deep trouble there. Not to mention what could happen in the Middle East uh, in terms of not only the Saudi Arabias and the Kuwaits and Iraqs of the world, but their client states. How do they have the money to prop them up as well? No, that, that's, that's a really interesting point. I was thinking earlier, uh, the falling oil prices does have an effect now, a bigger effect than it would have had on the U.S. economy because we are now a big major producer of oil again. Right. Uh, but, but we have a diversified economy. Some of those economies are not. The Middle Eastern economies, uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, and others. They're very much one-trick ponies. They're the classic uh, mineral resource boom-bust economies that, when the, when the prices do bust, end up in revolution. And we, unfortunately, don't have a good track record in getting the next government to particularly favor you know, U.S. interests or Western interests anymore. So that, I think that's, that's a worry. But you're right, Tyler. That's another thing, too, about this. I think the, uh, the worry about the job losses in the, in the U.S. drilling sector mm -hmm. and, uh, is overblown as well. Uh, the, the job numbers I have are only, it's only several hundred thousand, only several hundred thousand and good paying jobs, don't get me wrong. But again, not enough to take us down. There's just been too many other uh, service jobs, high tech jobs that have been part of this, this recovery uh, that, that have gotten us to where we are with our GDP numbers. So again, it's going to hurt, it's going to leave a mark, but not enough to take us down. All right, John, you're going to be back a little bit later in the program and we're going to talk about the potential for merger and acquisition activity in the sector. Look forward, forward to that to very much. Thank you. All right, John, see you in a few. It's still ahead from deep in the heart of Texas all the way up to North Dakota, how some of the cities in the heart of America's energy boom are faring as prices head south.
It was hailed as an oil boom for the first time in decades. The United States was increasing production dramatically, and certain parts of the country were reaping the rewards from Texas all the way up to North Dakota. Local economies firing on all cylinders, but with prices plummeting, there is now concern that fortunes could change. Brian Sullivan went to Midland, Texas, Williston, North Dakota, and to the Houston of Canada, Calgary, to see firsthand the impact of oil's plunge. With oil prices continuing to fall, the oil industry here in Texas is starting to feel some strain. And there is perhaps no place in the state that feels it as much as the city of Midland. For the past few years, Midland has been one of the fastest growing cities in the state. It's also got one of the highest average incomes of any place in America. Increased oil prices, improvements in drilling technology, and the controversial practice of fracking have set off a wave of investment in this far west Texas town over the past few years. In every direction here, there are new companies, new construction, building after building of oil rig operators, drillers, service companies, and everything else that is attached to the Permian Basin oil surge. According to Texas Tech University, the Permian boom sustains more than 400,000 jobs and more than 100 billion in total economic output. We asked longtime oil man and local resident Paul Kenworthy if all of this is at risk. Certainly not going to go away entirely, but as you can see from some of the equipment stacked in here, it's certainly going to slow down. And so the extent of the slowdown uh, uh, remains to be seen. But Texas has seen this movie before. In the past two or three decades, there have been a number of oil boom and bust cycles in the state, and those in the oil business do remain optimistic. We're only about 1% oversupplied, and so that will be corrected fairly quickly, I think, uh, during 2015 and early 2016, and then we'll be more of an equilibrium. As the price of oil has fallen, so too have the oil stocks. Though the bigger, older players tend to have much lower cost of production, many of the newer companies may need 50, 60, or even $70 a barrel oil to remain profitable. Investors in these companies and residents of Midland agree on one thing. It's not necessarily how low prices go in the short term, but rather how long they remain at these levels. The picture of the oil boom, people here in Williston, North Dakota, are hoping they don't become the center of a Bakken bust. The Bakken shale here in the rugged western edge of North Dakota has been one of America's greatest economic success stories of the past decade. As oil prices rose, production rose from 165,000 to more than 1 million barrels per day in just five years. With that surge came jobs, high paying ones. Oil field workers and truck drivers can earn more than $100,000 per year. Help wanted signs are everywhere. There are more jobs than people to fill them. The people have been coming from all over America and even the world. Some bringing everything they own in their car, some sleeping in their car because housing is so expensive. They have little in common, yeah. except looking to cash in on the American dream. You know, in the space of two years, um, I think I've built about 1,400 rooms across two or three camps at the minute. I've got another seven or eight hotels planned. But producing oil here is expensive. The ground is hard. Drilling takes more work. Most analysts put the average cost to bring a barrel of oil out of the ground at around $70 a barrel. And with oil's recent collapse in price below that level, people here, while still confident, are looking ahead. The plans are being made for this year, and I don't, I don't see a slowdown. There's, there's a lot of infrastructure to put in place. There's a lot of more wells that are still going to be drilled. Most agree that oil at these prices won't stop the boom all at once. Some oil companies operating here are more efficient than others and can withstand these lower prices, at least for now. But this is the real threat for the newer, higher cost producers. Many may need oil prices above $80 a barrel to keep justifying the rigs running. But if prices stay at this level for a few months or even longer, the Bakken boom could slow or even come to a halt just as quickly as it started. Here in Canada, oil's price collapse is front page news. And while consumers love the drop in the price of gasoline, the oil producers and the Canadian government do not. Rapidly falling oil prices are going to hit everything from government budgets to infrastructure building to the Canadian dollar and jobs. Massive Canadian oil company Suncor just announced it will be laying off 1,000 workers and cutting a billion dollars from its capital spending plan. The potential downside is great enough that high-ranking government officials are speaking out about it. Oil prices continue to slip 
Uh, we don't evidently, uh, haven't evidently seen the bottom yet. And uh, this has opened up uh, an enormous uh, revenue shortfall in terms of the Alberta government's budget, uh, quantified for next year as six to seven billion dollars, five billion dollars the year after that, five billion dollars the year after that if we don't uh, take action. Though finding an answer to the growing crisis is complex, the cause of the problem is not. The world is simply producing more oil than it is using. So with supply and demand so out of whack, we asked an oil economist, why don't the big oil producers simply cut back on production? When you get a price for, all producers try to offset the revenue loss by producing more. So it's a free for all for the moment. But uh, you know, until we start to see some of the uh, participants in this global thing t start to die off, we're gonna see low prices. Canada's oil pain is not just a Canada story. The stocks of more than 70 major Canadian companies trade in the United States. A number of those are oil companies, and they have been walloped. Shares of Baytex Energy, Penwest Petroleum, Enerplus, and Precision Drilling have seen their shares fall by more than 50 or even 60 percent in just a matter of months. Some call Calgary the Houston of Canada because of its strong job market and fast growth. But much of that is tied to the price of oil. And if oil's price were to fall lower or even stay at this level for a long period of time, the building boom that you can clearly see behind us may simply run out of gas. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Brian Sullivan in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And it's not just oil towns and energy-related companies that are feeling the pinch of lower prices. As Morgan Brennan reports, the ripple effect is spreading into other sectors. The collapse in oil prices is beginning to take a toll on other industries. United States Steel Corporation is temporarily idling two factories and laying off roughly 750 workers, a direct result of crude's dramatic plunge. Supplying tubes and pipes to oil and gas drillers is a key market for steelmakers and up until now has been a bright spot for the hard-hit industry. But with energy companies expected to slash capital spending by as much as 20 percent this year, that means less steel. U.S. direct steel consumption into the energy market is about 10 percent of the market, but when you include energy-related infrastructure, that number bumps up to about 15 percent. So the weaker growth in oil and gas is really driving down the growth rates in U.S. steel consumption this year. Factor in a stronger dollar and an oversupply expected to get worse, and 2015 doesn't look good for the commodity. But steel isn't alone. Other industrial companies are also beginning to feel oil's effects. General Electric recently said it expects revenue from its oil and gas segment to fall this year. GE's business, which makes compressors and drilling equipment, accounted for 12 percent of 2013's overall sales, with billions of dollars invested to expand that. And after a year of stellar growth, experts are watching railroad operators as well. As we see the potential for these lower crude prices to persist for a period of time in 2015, you could see some production drops. You could see some of the volumes on the crude or the sand side come down. However, Weatherby does note that oil and related fracking supplies make up only a tenth of overall rail volumes. Analysts warn that Caterpillar, which is already laying off workers due to weakness in mining, could also come under pressure from its exposure to oil and gas. And Archer Daniels Midland may feel the pinch of cheaper ethanol, which is falling as export demand wanes. But for every company hurt by oil's downturn, many others are benefiting. Airline carriers realizing cheaper fuel costs and retailers that could, at least in theory, see a boost as consumers spend more on things other than gasoline. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan. The drop in oil could be a driver of merger and acquisition activity in the energy sector this year as corporate profits come under pressure and valuations fall. Some companies may want to combine or look for takeover targets. John Kilduff of Again Capital is here again. Again Capital, back again. Once John, again. good to have you. Once, Once again. again. A little popcorn word. So as these uh, stock prices go down for some of these companies, uh, you got to figure that other bigger whales out there might want to buy some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, who and which? Well, obviously, as you saw from uh, Brian's report there earlier, there, a number of these companies, their stocks have gotten just crushed, right? They're, they're being priced as if they're knocking on death's door already when you forecast out the prices. So it's it, the, the, the acquired targets, the, the targets that should be you know, in the mix to be bought out by the bigger companies. So it's a tale of two cities, right? So companies like EOG Resources or Apache, they're going to be in the greatest, ExxonMobil, they're going to be in a position to be, to be picking up the... Uh, 
the leftovers here or the, mm -hmm. or the, or the dead bodies of, of, this, of this carnage that's coming. Mm -hmm. um, but companies then, the small ones, from Continental Resources on down, uh, Noble, uh, Regency uh, Partners, uh, EQT, uh, and, and companies like those that, that are, that are going to be struggling are the takeover candidates. Um, they've already been hammered. I'm not saying to go rushing into these names uh, right now, but it's certainly, that, that is, that's the model for what's going to happen. And we already saw this already as some of them see the writing the on the wall. Investment bankers must be licking their chops. Oh, they are. They're, they're getting a second dip here because they helped get these companies levered up yep. with right. all kinds of debt. <laughs> And now, and now they're going to help them survive. And you saw this uh, with Whiting Petroleum and the Kodiak merger that was announced back in December, using their stock, what's left of their stock, to come together and try to make something bigger than the sum of the parts. But it's also, there are big players in this mix as well. And you point to BP, which might have been doing a deal with Shell or a, another company. Why would they need to do that? And BP has already been struggling. Obviously, there are problems with, with the Macondo oil well and the, and the right. environmental disaster and everything they have paid and will have to pay. Uh, they've already been cutting back on, on people, on buybacks. So they're already, the, the blood's in the water there. So they're and in play. They, they really are. There's already been rumors about both Shell and ExxonMobil looking hard at them. And that would be a, a, a mega merger, uh, one, really almost a quint, akin to one of the Seven Sisters being, being brought in. I think to me that's the most delicious looking takeover target uh, of this whole sector. You can't go too wrong no matter what with BP uh, because it is a well-run company still mm -hmm. despite their struggles and it's been so beaten down. So that, I think that's my favorite one right now to try to say, hey, that's so the you, takeout. So there could be a, a merger uh, on the scale, not, not necessarily quite the same scale, of ExxonMobil, Chevron, Texaco. It's not just the little yes. guys. Yes, no, no, it's not just the little guys. And two, there's been several companies that were traditional vertically integrated where they uh, got the oil out of the ground, refined it, and sold it, like mm -hmm. Marathon, mm -hmm. uh, Hess, and Occidental Petroleum. They all have now been forced by activist investors split over the up. past year to split up and just focus on exploration and production. With the falling price, they need to expand their portfolios. They're going to have money to burn and, again, to go to those smaller names that are really struggling right and now. And a lot of people say, well, why don't they just refinance the, the debt because interest rates are so low? But if it's linked to the falling oil prices, there's nobody that's going to do that deal. That's right. To bring it on home to Main Street, that they don't have the FICO score to refinance. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, they really don't. So if I were if I were of a mind to, to go out and buy companies on the idea that some might be taken over, apart from naming names, which you did earlier, you'd look for what? You want to look for, for companies that... Um, have a decent amount of leverage uh, that have a, a, a decent uh, stock capitalization that can either use that stock to join up with somebody or have been so beaten down that it's just easy for an ExxonMobil or one of the bigger or Apache or Devon to pull the trigger and just snap them up, uh, which, which will from this low point will be a nice premium. They're still not going to be too happy about it, the original owners of these companies or these stocks. But those, the ones that have been beaten down, these ones that have been beaten down 60, 80 percent, mm -hmm. not necessarily buying them to be mm -hmm. turned around, mm -hmm. but to be bought, to be bought out. John, thank you very much. John thank Kilda, you. Appreciate it. And coming up, the spillover effect and what the falling price of oil could mean for the housing market. Cheaper gas may be just what the housing market needs to help fuel sales this year. But the majority of those sales could be concentrated in just certain parts of the country, leaving some cities high and dry. Diana Olick explains. Rows of townhomes are rising in Rockville, Maryland. It may be cold in this D.C. suburb, but sales are heating up, and lower gasoline prices could be fueling the surge. People are feeling, feeling far more comfortable with that extra money in their pocketbook. And yes, our traffic has been very high and sales are quite good, especially during the typically slow December season. But how much extra money is it really? Deutsche Bank ran the numbers and found with gas prices now down 23 percent, that adds about $100 in monthly income for the average American. And that translates to an 11 percent boost in purchasing power on a starter home. Not to mention mortgage rates have fallen in response to lower oil prices. 
For most Americans, it's a huge tax break. And Pulte Home CEO Richard Duga is not concerned about his company's large footprint in energy-heavy Texas. We are one of the most diversified builders with big holdings in the southeast, the Midwest, frankly, the West Coast. So I think whatever impact we may see, and again, I'm not commenting on demand for, from oil, I do think you'll see offset, frankly, by uh, buyers elsewhere. Elsewhere, though, will not be the far out exurbs. Builders are still sticking to the suburbs, even the edges. Lower gas prices, they say, are not enough to reverse the new migration to the cities. I think that the exurbs is a whole lot more than oil. So builders will stick to where the demand is and hope that more potential buyers will take their gas savings and spend it on a home. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Rockville, Maryland. And thanks for watching this special edition of Nightly Business Report. I'm Sue Herrera. And I'm Tyler Mathis. And thanks for me as well. Have a great evening, everybody. We'll see you back here tomorrow night.